Hi everyone, my name is Amanda McWirt. I'm a horticulture production specialist at the University of Arkansas. And today I'm gonna to talk about the basics of strawberry production in annual plasticulture systems. And we're gonna focus on production in the Southeastern United States. And we're basically gonna follow how the crop develops through the entire season. But let's first talk about the system of production that we're gonna be focusing on. Strawberries in the southeast are predominantly grown on an annual basis where the crop is planted each fall into hipped up rows that are covered in black plastic. Plastic culture is this combination of black plastic with drip irrigation tape underneath. The black plastic is important because it helps warm the soil surface and can help the crop develop more quickly in the spring. The plastic also helps suppress weeds and retain soil moisture. But because that plastic is shedding most of rainfall, we do have to have that drip irrigation tape underneath and that's how we're going to irrigate the crop. We can also use the drip irrigation tape as a means to apply fertilizers. So in the spring, we can typically mix uh, dissolved fertilizers into the irrigation water and fertilize on a weekly basis. This annual system using plastic is preferred over matted row or perennial systems because of the potential for high yields and improved fruit quality that are possible on plants in their first year. Also, because the crop is not carried over for several years, some insects and disease cycles can be broken up by either moving where the crop is planted each year or fumigating prior to planting to reduce pest pressure. And pest pressure is a major concern for us here in the Southeast. In this presentation, I'm primarily gonna be focusing on outdoor production, but some of the practices that we talk about will be relevant to high tunnel production as well. As you can see in the pictures that I have here on this slide, this is what a typical outdoor plastic culture production system looks like. And typically what we're looking for is to have around 15,000 to around 17 and a half thousand plants per acre. Down each row, growers will plant either double or triple, triple rows of plants through each bed, and plants are typically spaced around 12 to 16 inches apart in the row. Then these beds are typically spaced about five to six feet uh, apart, uh, and typically we wanna have either some mulch, like some straw or um, a living mulch, like uh, some annual ryegrass planted in the row middles, um, just to prevent soil washing and uh, splashing of soil up onto the plants. Now yield per acre is gonna be heavily dependent on crop management, cultivar selection, and weather. But typically the cultivars grown in the Southeast with good management practices can yield anywhere from a half of a pound to one and a half pounds per plant. There are six major stages of the cropping cycle. Crop dormancy occurs during the winter Flowering occurs during early spring. Fruiting follows in mid to late spring. Then we have an off season during the summer where the old plants are removed, soil is renovated, and other pre-plant preparations are made for the upcoming fall season. Planting occurs in sometime in mid-September to mid-October, depending on your region. And then we have a post-plant establishment period in the late fall. Our class will follow this season with classes in dormancy, flowering, fruiting, two classes during the summer for different pre-plant recommendations, and then one class to follow planting um, in the establishment period in the fall. So we look forward to having you follow along with us throughout the course. Because we are following the season of production, this means that some important topics like economics won't be covered until later in the course. But there are two key considerations related to economics that anyone interested in getting started in strawberry production must consider, and these are marketing and labor. A plan for how the crop will be marketed should always be established before planting. You know, there's a lot of different options for how to market strawberries. Uh, anything from wholesale markets, pick your own, to local sales, including farmers markets, and in some cases even farm to school, are all different ways strawberries are sold in our region. These different markets have different requirements, regulations, and may even demand different market values for the crop. So it's important that a grower really take this into consideration and figure out what kind of marketing strategy is gonna work best for them. The second issue is this requirement for hand labor to produce the crop. By and large, the crop is all hand planted and hand harvested. And when we're harvesting, we're harvesting at least twice a week uh, in the spring season. And these labor costs can make up a significant part of a grower's annual budget. 
Uh, so it's important that growers are able to find reliable workers. And this can sometimes be a struggle, struggle for many small growers who are just starting out. There are federal programs that are available like H2A that help bring in foreign workers, and these are often used on larger operations. Finally, I really want to point out that while strawberries are among the highest value specialty crops that can be grown, strawberry production in and of itself is also expensive and there are many risks. Um, the crop is very highly perishable and can only be held in cold storage for a few days before losing quality. And it, the crop is susceptible to several diseases that if they are not controlled can result in major crop losses. There's also risks from weather, including rain during harvest that can lead to soft fruit that cannot be marketed or sold. And so successful strawberry production really requires detailed management of the crop, including precise pest, fertility, and irrigation management. I also briefly want to comment on the equipment and infrastructure needed for plastic culture strawberry production. And some of this could include tractors, bed layers, um, and possibly bed layers that will be compatible with fumigation equipment if fumigation is planning to be used. Um, transplanters, which are generally used on a large scale to speed planting, but still require people to set the plants, as you can see in the top right hand corner. Some kind of spraying equipment will be required for both organic and conventional production. And then cooling facilities uh, to hold fruit once picked um, is also going to be required. And often the, some kind of cooled transportation to move fruit either to the market or even between the field and the cooling facility are used. Uh, the cooling facility you see here is quite large, but smaller units are often custom built by growers. And for an example of this, this cool transportation unit that you see in the bottom picture was built by a grower to transport fruit from the field to their cooling facility. And it's essentially just a box with an air conditioning unit attached to it that they placed in the back of a Kubota. So now let's move on and talk about how strawberry plants grow. Strawberries are a crown forming plant and the crown is essentially a compressed stem. So if you think of a stem as having buds all up and down it, this is what the crown is, but it is compressed. And so those buds in the strawberry crowns are held um, kind of very closely together. Now those buds can develop into several different things. Um, they can develop either into an inflorescence, which is just a stalk or stem of flowers that will later develop into the fruit. They can turn into a runner, which is um, kind of a modified stem or a stolon that can produce daughter plants at the end of it. The buds can also develop into branch crowns, which can subsequently also produce their own flowers, runners, etc. In the picture on the uh, right hand side, uh, you can see where we have this main crown in the center and then at the base of that main crown, two branch crowns are being uh, produced. We do want the plants to produce a few branch crowns so that there are more opportunities for flowers to be produced. Now, because the crown is the origin of all the plants growth, it is very sensitive to being buried and the plants that are planted too deep will not produce well. So we do have to be careful when planting strawberries to make sure that um, uh, the soil line hits just at the base of the crown. Strawberries are a cool season crop and they grow best when the temperature is in the mid 50s to 70 degrees Fahrenheit uh, and they do better to generally when we have cool nights. Strawberries have a low chilling requirement of only around 200 to 300 hours and this just refers to needing temperatures between about 45 and 28 before they can bloom and produce fruit following dormancy. Now I said we want the plant to produce several branch crowns before we fruit it in order to increase the number of flowers that can be produced per plant. But what determines if the buds on the crown turn into flowers, runners, or branch crowns? This is generally determined by a combination of the cultivar's genetics, temperature, and day length. And so for most cultivars that we grow in the southeast, we generally divide the plants into two big groups based on how they respond to this combination of day length and temperature. Uh, and these two groups are often called June bearing types and day neutral types, or short day and long day types. But it's important to realize that in strawberries, these two groups are not necessarily distinct, and there's more of a continuum between the two. But what distinguishes cultivars that are June bearing from day neutral? 
So June bearing types, um, which for example, uh, Chandler and the commonly grown Camarosa are examples of June bearing types. They start the process of forming branch crowns and flower buds during the short and cooler days of fall and then bloom in the spring. And this is important, this shortening day length where generally the day length is less than 14 hours and the cooler temperatures are sending these signals to the plant to form either branch crowns early in the fall or inflorescences later in as the days continue to shorten. Now this response is temperature dependent, and so if it gets too cold, this process can be stopped. So if we think about this in uh, terms of us planting these plants in the fall, where they're exposed to the shortening days and cooler temperatures, that starts that process of branch crown uh, development initiating flowers, and then it gets cold enough in the winter that the process stops and the plants go dormant. And then in the spring with the warming temperatures, the uh, plants wake back up and uh, the flowers start to develop. Now, by contrast, day neutral types in general don't respond as strongly to day length and instead develop flowers and branch crowns in kind of a continuous cycle as long as the temperatures are between around 45 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. This means that these plants can potentially be fruited in both the fall and the spring. Now, these are just very general rules of thumbs because uh, rules of thumb, and, and it's important to realize that strawberries are somewhat complicated and that this response or lack of a response to day length can be reversed in some cases if the temperature is extreme enough. So what does this crown development really look like? When we plant the plants in the fall, they're generally going to start out as a single crown. And then uh, by the time we get into winter, we will see that the plants will have developed about one to two additional branch crowns, which is what you can see here in this middle picture. By spring, we're going to want to see a few more branch crowns be evident. And generally what we're looking for is around four to six branch crowns to bear fruit on in the spring. Now the ideal number of branch crowns per plant uh, is going to be very cultivar dependent. A concern we do have is, is that fruit size reduction can occur if there are too many branch crowns. And we generally see that fruit size starts to drop uh, once we get to around eight to ten branch crowns per plant. And so for this reason, we do want to avoid planting too early in the fall, uh, which would allow the plant to develop too many crowns. Now let's remember back to the buds on the crown um, and that they can also form runners, which we typically do not want in commercial production. This is because the plant is putting effort into making daughter plants and not branch crowns. You will see runners here in several pictures at, at various stages of development everything to where the runner is just starting to form to where you can actually see um, a, a daughter plant being formed out at the end. Runners are generally removed from the plants in the fall after planting to stop the plant from continuing to put energy into the daughter plant development. And runners are typically produced on June bearing types during long days. Um, the daughter plants produced at the end of the runners are often called runner tips like you see in this center picture. And these are actually used to propagate strawberry plants, which are rooted in soil media to produce what are called plug plants. Once we get to the spring and the plants start to produce the inflorescences and in bloom, um, this is what we're gonna see. And so we see this one main stem off of which several different fruits and flowers are being produced. The number of blooms per inflorescence is variable by cultivar. But generally, we're going to see that the king berry is the biggest fruit and the first to ripen, as you see here in this bottom picture. But notice that there are still green berries developing and some flowers, uh, all on the same inflorescence. This means that the plants will produce fruit over an extended period, which in the southeast can last anywhere from around four to six weeks or more on average. Let's take a closer look at uh, the development of a strawberry flower into a berry. Strawberry flowers have both male and female parts and can be self-pollinated with wind, but we generally see the best fruit set when there are pollinators present, and for this reason, bees are often kept in the field during bloom. After the flower is pollinated, the petals will drop and the fruit will start to develop at the center. It's about 28 to 30 days from a bloom to a ripe strawberry fruit. Strawberries are cold hardy to about 10 degrees Fahrenheit during dormancy, but slowly become more sensitive to cold temperature as bloom advances, and the open bloom stage is the most susceptible to cold temperature damage. So on this slide, you can see this chart of how 
um, different bloom stages or crop developmental stages uh, can be impacted by cold temperatures. Right now during dormancy, the plants should be protected with row covers if the temperatures are predicted to get into the low teens to prevent that crown from being damaged at around 10 degrees Fahrenheit. As the plants start to wake up later in the spring and emerge buds develop, these can be damaged at around 20 to 25 degrees Fahrenheit. Once blooms are open, they can be damaged once temperatures get to just below freezing at around 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, realize that many of these stages may be happening simultaneously as we see in this picture. So we would be worried about protecting the most cold sensitive stage, which in this picture is the open bloom. So keep in mind that we really have two separate times at which cold damage can occur. The first is during dormancy with cold damage to the crown, and the second is during bloom. So just for reference, here are some examples of what cold damage looks like on strawberries. Um, one way to check for cold damage on strawberries and the crowns is to actually cut open the crowns. So dig up a plant and cut it in half. Normally what we wanna see immediately after first cutting into that crown is that the color be creamy white like what you see in the left-hand photo. If you cut open a crown and see darkening like what is present in the center picture, this indicates a problem. And in this case, the darkening and necrosis indicate cold damage. So the temperatures got below 10 degrees during dormancy and the crown was damaged. Some diseases can also result in darkening of the crown tissue, so keep that in mind that you may be looking at something else occurring as well. Then on the right hand side we have two blooms. Um, the top one is still yellow and alive, the bottom one has this characteristic black eye which indicates cold damage and that the flower was killed and will not produce a berry. We look forward to having you follow along with us throughout this course. I hope that this was a nice introduction into how the strawberry crop develops through the season. Please feel free to get in touch if you have questions.